Michael there and welcome back to this third edition of what the I was calling it what the heck and I started thinking like you know heck is a euphemism for hell and I don't know what do you think I just I don't want to scandalize anybody so now I'm calling it what the and basically the whole premise is that many of us here in 2020 are scratching our heads and saying what happened how did we get to where we are right now and I'm a big believer in Pope Leo XIII's encyclical, which is called Eterni Patris, where he basically laid the blame at the foot of philosophers. Bad philosophy has crept into schools and movies and the common culture, and we really didn't see it coming because most people don't pay attention to philosophy. But we want to hear. I'm no expert, but I have studied St. Thomas Aquinas. I do think that's kind of like the gold standard. And so I went back beginning after Aquinas. I know there were, you know, bad philosophers before Aquinas, but let's say the premise of this is that Aquinas put together a good synthesis using all the great, you know, Christian and pagan and Muslim and Jewish philosophers before him and put together a good, a good philosophy, a good theology. And then since then, for the last 700 years or so, it's been dismantled by many people. All right, so we're going to go over those. And again, I appreciate the dialogue. And this one is interesting. And before we get into Desiderius Erasmus Rotorodamus, all right, you can see lived basically half his life in the 15th century, half in the 16th century. He lived at the time of the Protestant Reformation, at least for you know, a couple decades of it. He was aware of Luther, and he and Luther had to head it back and forth, as we'll see in just a minute. Before that, though, I just want to kind of show you the, and I'm going to make myself smaller here, um, and show you kind of where I'm getting this information that I'm getting. And if you go here, this is all Wikipedia, and I, I tend to think, you know, Wikipedia is a pretty good basic source of information. I try credit them you know, when I, when I use things because I know they're compiling from a lot of different people. But here on Wikipedia, you see in the, it's interesting, here's the, here's the uh, 14th century, and you see that you had people like Dun Scotus, who is a, um, a Franciscan, lived around the time of Aquinas. He actually, you know, Aquinas, well, Aquinas died in about 1275, so they overlapped each other by about 10 years or so. And then you got William uh, of Ockham, who we've already talked about, and then John Wycliffe, who we've talked about, and some others as well. The interesting thing is, now that we get into, the, when you get into the 1400s, it's like crickets. I mean, have you heard of any of these people? Nicholas of Cusa, Lorenzo Valla? So, as I mentioned in the last one, John Wycliffe set the stage for the Protestant Reformation, and he had a lot of beliefs that the Reformers are going to pick up on, but then it's like crickets for the next century. Everything's percolating, right? But not a whole lot officially is going on. I don't know. I mean, I haven't heard of these people, but then you get into the 16th century, and you can see that Wikipedia divides the 16th century into two half centuries. And we're going to be talking about Erasmus here, who's kind of an interesting character. And then we'll talk about Machiavelli. Copernicus was more of a scientist. I'm not sure if I'll talk about him or not. St. Thomas More, of course, one of my great heroes. Uh, he was, you know, killed at the guillotine. He well, had his head chopped off by King Henry VIII. Martin Luther, of course, that's the big one. And he was somewhat a contemporary of De Erasmus. Never heard of Petrus Ramus, but then we get into the second half of the 16th century, and we'll cover John Calvin. Some of these people I'm not too familiar with. You know, I don't know, maybe Kepler. And then 17th century, things really start to get wild with, you know, of course, the whole controversy with Galileo. And then we'll certainly spend a lot of time on Rene Descartes. You know, I think I, I think therefore I am. So, and then we'll keep going. You know, Hobbes. We'll certainly cover him. And uh, who else from this um, century? And there's certainly John Locke. We'll 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 cover and do a, a video on him. But let me know what you think. And I want to get into 
Erasmus here as we continue this kind of you know what the you know <laughs> what is going on and I'm gonna make myself bigger all right there we go all right so let, let's talk about Erasmus I think the interesting thing about Erasmus I'm, not, I'm just gonna call him Erasmus because that's how he's known again lived from 1466 to 1536 I think what you'll find about him is he's kind of a middle-of-the-road guy you know you could argue that he's um, a man of the church as we'll see in this uh, slide here he was Dutch you know the two that we've talked about so far have been English uh, in Ockham and Wycliffe now we got a guy from Holland he's a Christ Christian scholar he also a Catholic priest and a humanist that's the first time we've kind of had this whole humanist uh, in fact, he was called the crowning glory of the Christian humanists. Uh, his most famous works were on free will and in praise of folly. You probably have heard of those. Erasmus remained a member of the Catholic Church all his life, remaining committed to reforming the church and its clerics' uh, abuses from within. And you got to at least hand that to him because Luther is going to take a different approach. Luther is going to not only try to reform the church, but he he bails. You know, he leaves and he marries a former nun and and look at the legacy of that's pro probably why you know the name luther more than you know the name erasmus is that luther caused a bigger stink started his own religion whether he meant to or not we got lutherans to this day and erasmus i think had good intentions but you'll see that he tried to play such a middle road that i think we can relate to people today who don't quite pick a side and they're in that kind of murky muddy middle and they're kind of hard to peg and you'll see this as we go on that he was a precursor in fact he very much was for ecumenism and I can't really put him in the category of Wycliffe because you know the church didn't never excommunicated Erasmus and into many in many ways he was a, a he was a, a good son of the church but a little squishy i would say all right he had this middle of the road approach and so basically <laughs> both sides were upset with him angered it says you know scholars in both camps so already you're beginning to see this divide between the people who want to be loyal to mother church and the people who want to rebel leave start their own religions and erasmus kind of had one foot in each door uh, certain abuses in religious orders were among the chief objects of his later calls to reform the church from within. Again, I, I, I credit him with that. Despite all his criticism of clerical corruption and abuses within the Catholic Church, which lasted for years and was also directed towards many of the church's basic doctrines, Erasmus shunned the Reformation movement along with its most radical and reactionary offshoots and sided with neither party. Okay, interesting, right? Because Wycliffe was much more of a rebel, he was battling with the church, and I think if we look back in the uh, 15th to 16th century, you probably see a lot of the abuses that we see today, and the anger, you know, you've got people on social media like the Michael Borises or the Taylor Marshalls who really are frustrated and calling out the church. And so you see these kind of characters, even though they didn't have social media, that are, are calling out the church, but uh, you just like, you know, Taylor Marshall and Michael Voris, they're not leaving the church, but they're trying to reform within. I think Erasmus kind of falls into that category, okay? Um, interestingly, though, here, Scott Dixon, you see the, the credit there below, said Erasmus had been criticizing the Catholic Church for years before the reformers emerged, and not just pointing out its failings, but questioning many of its basic teachings. He was the author of a series of publications, including a Greek edition of the New Testament. He very much was into translations of the uh, of Scripture, which laid the foundation for a motto of Christianity that called for a pared-down, internalized style of religiosity focused on Scripture rather than on the elaborate and incessant outward rituals of the medieval church. So, since the basis of these videos is claiming that Thomistic philosophy is the gold standard, I think you would see a lot of ways that Erasmus kind of picked away at Aquinas. You know, again, he's according to Mr. Dixon here, he 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 wasn't all that, you know, 
on board with the medieval church, you know, the, the age of Christendom. I, I would argue that the 13th century was one of the great centuries of the Catholic Church, right? Problems for sure. Erasmus was not a forerunner in the sense that he conceived or defended ideas that later made up the substance of Reformation thought. It is enough that some of his ideas merged with the later Reformation message. Again, just like Wycliffe, he influenced people like Luther, like Calvin, like Zwingli, like, you know, the, the, the people that started the, the Reformation and which continues uh, to this day. All right. So, again, this is probably the, the, uh, the rap on Erasmus is that, you know, again, we don't understand the, the time that he lived. And maybe this is about as, the best you can do living in the 16th century with so much corruption going on. Erasmus described him as a, uh, as a mighty trumpet of gospel truth. While agreeing, it is clear that many of the reforms of which Luther called are urgently needed. Okay, so he, he had a sympathy for Luther. When Erasmus hesitated to support him, the straightforward Luther became angered that Erasmus was avoiding the responsibility due either to cowardice or a lack of purpose. All right, so again, Erasmus is taking this middle road and he's angering everybody. Okay, I'm sure the church was a little bit angry with him as well. This is Erasmus talking to Luther. He said, I know nothing of your church. At the very least, it contains people who will, I fear, overturn the whole system and drive the princes into using force to restrain good men and bad alike. The gospel, the word of God, faith, Christ, and Holy Spirit, these words are always on their lips. Look at their lives, and they speak quite another language. So he's seeing the hypocrisy of the reformers. He's saying that, hey, you guys are claiming one thing, but I don't know what your church is. Are you going to be overturning the whole system? So he saw the beauty of the Catholic Church. And he saw the dangers of the Reformation. That's why I think we ought to study a little bit more of Erasmus. I think he's a very important voice. In 1529, seven years before he died, he writes an epistle against those who falsely boast they are evangelicals. You declaim bitterly against the luxury of priests, the ambition of bishops, and the tyranny of the Roman pontiffs, and the babbling of the sophists against our prayers, fasts, and masses. And you are not content to retrench the abuses that may be in these things, but must needs abolish them entirely all right this is a this is a great quote he's saying okay let's let's reform i think that's what we, where we are today in the church in 2020 is uh, no good good churchmen don't want to leave the church we want to reform the church we don't want to run out of it but there is a lot of need for reform okay now he said we are dealing with this would a stable mind depart from the opinion handed down by so many men famous for holiness and miracles, to part from the decision of the church and you know, commit our souls to the faith of someone like you who has sprung up just now with a few followers. He's talking to Luther. Although the leading men of your flock do not agree either with you or among themselves, indeed, though you do not even agree with yourself, since in the same assertion you say one thing in the beginning and something else later on, recanting what you said before. Isn't this interesting? Because that's what we say today is that there's a lot of inconsistencies with Luther, with the reformers, certainly with Henry VIII and Anglicanism and the Church of England back in the 16th century. Erasmus is pointing it out at this time, okay, back when it was happening. That's why important. In his catechism, Erasmus took a stand against Luther's teaching by asserting the unwritten sacred tradition is just as valid a source of revelation as the Bible by enumerating the deuterocanonical books and the canon of the Bible and by acknowledging seven sacraments. He called blasphemers anyone who questioned the perpetual virginity of Mary. However, he supported lay access to the Bible. Okay, no, no good big complaints there. Again, he seems to have more criticism of Luther than praise of him, although he saw you know, some of the good of Luther. In a letter to Nicholas von Elmsdorf, Luther objected to Erasmus's catechism and called Erasmus a viper, a liar, and the very mouth and organ of Satan. <laughs> okay, flattering words. As regards the Reformation, Erasmus was accused by the monks to have prepared the way and was responsible for Martin Luther. Erasmus, they said, had laid the egg, and Luther had hatched it. Erasmus wittily dismissed the charge, claiming that Luther had hatched a different bird entirely. So you see what was going on back in the 16th century. There was a big fight going on. The church and the reformers, 
and Erasmus, again, I'm repeating myself, had kind of one foot in each camp. Maybe, I don't know, it, you know, looking at it 500 years later, we see what a mess it's been. A test of the Reformation was the doctrine of the sacraments, and the crux of this question was the observance of the Eucharist. In 1530, Erasmus published a new edition of the Orthodox Treatise of Algiris against the heretic Berengar of Tours in the 11th century. He added a dedication affirming his belief in the reality of the body of Christ after consecration, the Eucharist, commonly referred to as transubstantiation. Okay, again, Erasmus is hard to kind of get a handle of. Certain works of Erasmus laid a foundation for religious toleration and ecumenism. For example, uh, he opposed certain views of Martin Luther. Erasmus noted that religious disputants should be temperate in their language because in this way, the truth, which is often lost amidst too much wrangling, may be more surely perceived, although Erasmus did not oppose the punishment of heretics in individual cases, he, regard, he generally argued for moderation and against the death penalty. He wrote, it is better to cure a sick man than to kill him. All right, so you see a lot of Erasmus today. Look at Pope Francis and what he has changed the catechism, the definition of the, the death penalty. And there's, there's an ecumenical spirit that would almost prefigure Vatican II, reaching out to other, other religions and not condemning them. Erasmus, I think, really deserves more study as we look at 2020 and what we're dealing with right now. Love him or hate him, this guy was taking the middle road when most people were going one direction or the other. And so, anyways, that's, uh, that's where we are. We'll take a look at Machiavelli next. And then, as I mentioned a moment ago, a very quiet 14th, 1400s, 15th century and then when we get into the 16th century, you know, the door gets busted open and it gets a little crazy. And then we're going to move all the way to modern philosophers. And again, I really appreciate conversation, dialogue about this. What do you think? What do you think of Erasmus? Did you learn anything from this? Or maybe you, maybe you know a whole lot more about Erasmus than I do. Again, I open, a, I open it up to discussion so we can try to figure out how we got to where we are today. And more importantly... How do we get back to an authentic Christian philosophy and theology in the way that Leo XIII envisioned and hoped for in his encyclical Eternity Patris? This has been What the... I'm Dave Palmer. Thanks for joining me.